we are at five o'clock. Um, so let me just do um, yeah, a quick introduction, just normally to the Zoom controls, first of all. As I said, there will be a, a Q&A towards the end. Um, please do write your questions in the Q&A panel rather than in the comments feed. It just makes it much easier for us to monitor them and make sure they get answered for you. Um, feel free to, to write in the chat feed. So I can see a couple of you already have. It's always good to know where you're, you're joining, where you're listening from. Um, any comments that may be specific to a slide that Simon has up at the time, and if there's a relevant moment to interject, I will try and pose that question there and then. Um, otherwise, um, yeah, Simon, thank you very much for doing yet another webinar for us. And I know this webinar is about some recent work that you were shooting on the East Coast of America. Um, this, was it three months worth of work from December to February? No, so this this is the this specific um, chapter of the project. Yeah, was from uh, December twenty twenty to the start of February twenty twenty one. Can I jump into it, or, or are you yeah, still yeah, doing of course, it? Go for it? Great, cool. So thank you, Robin. Thank you, Leica, for hosting another one of these. Um, I've done quite a few webinars with with uh, Leica, but I've never actually done one that's actually focused on on one of my projects specifically. I'm very used to talking about photography but I don't really spend a lot of time talking about my photographs specifically. So this is kind of a, a, a new topic to me. Uh, apologies in advance if I stumble. Um, you know, it, I, I'm very used to talking about theory, um, but in terms of my own application um, and, and the results when, when working on a project of this scale is, is a bit new. Uh, the way I'll be discussing this is more about the way a kind of a project works uh, and the ways that it can come together rather than a specific look at the overall project itself. So if you have questions about that, save it either um, for the end or for when I eventually do one when the project is actually complete. Um, the majority of the photographs I'll be showing during this presentation have never been seen before, which is also something I'll be discussing at the end. Um, the structure of the presentation is that I'm gonna be talking through a few anecdotes and aspects, but it's not a full account of the entire project, just the highlights, um, the highlights so far. And again, if you enjoy uh, hearing about the work and the way that I work, then please let us know. Um, I can work on you know, future webinars where I discuss other stories and other projects that I've worked on. Uh, the first aspect is the traveling during a pandemic. I know that I've had a lot of questions about this topic already from the people who know um, what, you know what was necessary to actually go and photograph at this time. Um, because I traveled in mid-December 2020, the restrictions around travel uh, and the advice that was being given was very different to the uh, kind of stricter enforcement that followed and, and even uh, continues to today. Um, as I was traveling for work, for work on this project, there weren't any issues with me leaving the country, um, although because there were entry restrictions to the US, I couldn't fly directly there. Uh, instead, I flew to Bulgaria, where I spent two weeks working on a different project over Christmas, and then on the 26th, I was able to fly to the States. Uh, I had a lot of advice and help from the US Embassy in London and the US Embassy in Bulgaria and the UK Embassy in New York. Uh, I stayed in frequent communication with all of them throughout to make sure that everything was okay. Uh, it's my first time ever working, you know, um, abroad during such a, such a situation as many people also had to navigate, uh, but I, I had a lot of help from them. I also had help from the National Union of Journalists. Um, they gave me a lot of advice and a, and a really uh, lovely letter of accreditation. Um, I didn't have the resources or capacity to apply for an IFJ card at the time, but it, uh, it, as it turned out, I didn't need one. Uh, but I did manage to set up kind of safety nets in place for emergencies. Uh, luckily, I didn't need to use those through my trip. Uh, when it came to entering the States, I had no issues. They checked that I hadn't flown directly from the UK. Uh, and after this, I went directly to New Jersey, where I stayed for the rest of my trip. Um, usually when I'm in the States, I stay a bit closer to um, New York City Center, which is, was, was prior to this my only experience of the States. Um, staying in New Jersey was uh, cheaper for me, but also allowed me to spend time there in, in less of a kind of uh, touristy fashion, um, more, more kind of rural. Um, in terms of the gear, which everyone knows is my favorite thing to talk about, <laughs> um, I had my M6, my M4. Uh, I tend to overpack film uh, because I'd rather have too many than too few. Um, uh, I took a 35, 50 and 90 millimeter and that's it. I spent most of my time shooting on 35 and 90. You can probably tell um, from the photographs that you'll see what was shot on what, uh, because there's, there's quite a difference between those lenses. Um, sometimes I would switch out for the 35 and 50, but I never really shot 
3550 is in the 90 was always on my M6. Um, that's how I like it. Uh, I sent a film development kit to where I'd be staying, which means that uh, my nights uh, were spent developing, which gave me as little work as possible to do once I was back in the UK, um, which, which worked out quite nicely. I, I had 10 days in quarantine when I returned and I spent all of that time scanning and was able to get through my workflow that way. Um, I took six year olds total, shot 54 across both Bulgaria and the States. 14 of them were in Bulgaria. So that's 40 roles total that this chapter of the project is based on. Uh, the first thing that I hit after arriving in terms of events was uh, New Year's Eve. Um, this isn't really something that I've celebrated in the States. And you know, with, with no gatherings, it was very different than, than the kind of large gathering that tends to happen at Times Square. Um, I spent some time walking up and down the city, but there, you know, there was nothing really major, no huge celebrations, just kind of small isolated groups. Uh, this photograph was taken during a street party uh, that was shortly afterwards broken up by the police for being a gathering. Um, I think the star tiara against the smoky backdrop with the skyscrapers, traffic lights, you know, that, that all ties the scene quite well together. Um, I think it has enough kind of New York iconography while also communicating the kind of New Year's iconography but you can also tell that it's far, far less busy than it would tend to be um, on a New Year's Eve in New York City. Uh, the next day, I went to Asbury Park for the Polar Plunge. This is um, a yearly event that happens where people um, jump into the freezing cold ocean to bring in the new year. Again, uh, people weren't allowed to do this in large groups, but they were kind of smaller family uh, and community units. Uh, I had no issues with documenting this. It was a, it was a really great community driven story. Um, uh, anyway, it was far more community based than the, the kind of previous breakouts of celebration in New York the, the previous evening. There, I know that there are a few groups in the UK who do something similar, and I was able to find the group in New Jersey that did this. Um, I, th I think that this was a, a really um, strong point of the project, which is the, the kind of normalcy being disrupted. So you've got these communities and ideas, uh, you know, people kind of finding a workaround to, to, to being kept separated while still. Um, participating while also staying safe. And I thought that this event was a great example of, of these workarounds. Um, later on, I, I saw that the same event had happened in Coney Island, which is further away from me. If I do document New Year's Day again, it will be based on that. Um, uh, but I still would want to revisit the New Jersey community as well. Um, and as, as, as will become a recurring theme, my ability to work on these events for the project is as good as my research. And so far my research had been limited to the state I was staying in. Um, street photography is, is pretty essential to me when it comes to investigating uh, different routes I can take my project in. Um, you know, a, a good street discovery can guide and inform the rest of my story, as well as lending a kind of foundation to uh, the, the hopefully more powerful, image I'll, uh, powerful images I'll be creating. Um, it's a great way to feel out a space and to meet potential subjects to, to pull on different threads. Um, after, new, after all the, the New Year's events passed, uh, I spent most of my time on the streets in New York. Uh, I'm looking for aspects and iconography that tie into my wider narrative for this project. Um, new York previously, I've, I've spent most of my time as a street photographer. This is my first time approaching it as a documentary photographer. And you know the, the, the different protests, the process, the different uh, drive and purpose changed the work I was producing by quite a lot. Uh, it really changed what I was looking for in terms of more abstract and interpretable scenes to things that actually had uh, storytelling value. Um, so so I, I divided my street photography time between New York, Pennsylvania, um, New Jersey, and eventually DC, which I'll get to. Uh, the photograph on this slide is of a man um, cleaning the roof of one of the indoor outdoor solutions to dining during a pandemic. Um, this is, you know, it, a lot of street photography methods go into making a photograph like this, but it has more of a documentary purpose um, uh, as, as relating to the kind of city life at this time. Um, time for a documentary uh, project is one of the most important things. Uh, with, with more time, I was able to you know, explore different locations um, as I was directed by the project I was working on, the story I was telling rather than just, you know, wandering the streets. Um, I was looking for ideas around people, community, patriotism, um, this kind of respect that people had for each other and different iconography examples. Um, when my time isn't as planned, when there are specific events for New Year's Eve, New Year's Day, 
um, I had a lot of freedom to work through things through uh, trial and error, which means not just hitting the highlights, um, but making sure I'm, you know, specifically making mistakes and wasting time more comfortably, because that's part of the process. Um, this is actually the longest trip I've had outside of the UK so far, and the longest I've worked on an assignment nonstop without breaks. Um, and all of that comes from just allowing myself that extra time to work. Um, as I said, there are plenty of classical themes that I could work with, but there's also the kind of looming presence. There's the, you know, the political situation that was happening at the time and the kind of medical crisis that was happening at the time. The continuing lockdown meant a lot of different rules, a lot of different um, things that needed to happen around gatherings, which meant that the landscape of the street was very different to what many were used to. Um, that kind of change in the New York City landscape was a story in and of itself and was definitely compounded by the winter mood. Um, I've previously spent previously spent time in New York in spring and summer. Uh, the last time was actually March in 2020, um, just as it was going into lockdown. So I was actually picking up threads of, of the previous story I'd started to tell then um, and was able to look at, some, at the way that some of those ideas had kind of played out or, or concluded in some cases. Um, while I was working on all of this, I was also um, doing research and I was in contact with the press team of a, rep sorry, a representative for DC um, because I wanted to shadow him during uh, the time for the inauguration, which is when I would be there. Um, now, a very significant event happened on January 6th, and because I hadn't researched properly, I wasn't where I probably should have been as a photographer, um, which is something I still regret. Uh, there, was an, there were enough excellent photographers that documented that day in DC, and it you know, it would have been a huge aspect of my project, but it, it changed what I was going to do when I was there uh, for the days leading up to and around the 20th for the actual inauguration itself. Um, something I learned from missing out on this uh, situation was to um, pay closer attention to what my peers were doing, to what other photographers were doing with their plan. I watched people I knew heading to DC for what I thought would just be, you know, a, a regular political rally. Um, I didn't have the connections or research at the time to understand the significance of what was going to happen. Um, and, you know, as many others who missed out on it were kicking themselves to this day because it was, you know, a, a moment in history. Um, but having said that, it was very well documented by those photographers who were there and it's, you, can, you can, um, can and should definitely fly, find uh, plenty of the photography that was made there uh, from those who worked immensely hard and risked a lot to be there. Um, what did happen on this day for me is that you know whatever my plans and expectations for my project may have originally been the landscape has now shifted because of this kind of cataclysmic political event um it changed the entire purpose of my trip because this project had been centered around originally the events of the inauguration and obviously that was now not going to look the way that most people expected it to um i was in washington square park while watching the news happen uh, and there were a few other photographers there who i met um, you know, you can always tell who the hard workers are because those are the ones you meet out on the street. Um, so, I, you know, I had a chat with them and shared some ideas. Uh, one borrowed one of my lenses for a bit. We walked around Union Square over to City Hall but because we thought there might be something happening, you know, in, in the different capitals, but it was just, um, you know, the main events happening at the capital that day. Uh, the photograph on this, this slide was made that morning before anything kind of unfolded in D.C., and ultimately it wasn't a particularly productive day for me. Um, back to the time aspect, I really found that, you know, that for being able to live in America is very different to being there as a, as a traveler or as a tourist. And I found myself picking up on small details, which I definitely would have missed if I wasn't in the kind of less built up areas. Um, even really simple things like shopping centers, diners, um, being in these spaces is, is very underrated and I think is a, is a great way to actually um, be more a part of the culture than just being in the tourist hotspot. Um, an example of this is one night I passed by a parking lot at a time where I wouldn't have been out if I was in the city um, and there was a, a, a small community playing hockey. Um, I went and chatted with them, spent some time making photographs of them and I really think that this is the kind of scene you only get from being kind of familiar from living in that space, not something that's easy to stumble upon because it's just because of where it's located in, in, uh, in reference to where everything else is. Um, it's not a touristy area, it's by a school in a residential space. Um, and it's not somewhere I would think of really spending much time if it wasn't part of my commute that night. 
um, a few more photographs of this uh, scene and a slightly more in-depth account I wrote up for the uh, 35MMC blog, which is a great resource for photographers um, if anyone's looking for, for blog posts to read in general, but also about this specifically. Um, again, because of the time, because of my location, I was more central. I was able to look at taking day trips into the neighboring states like Philadelphia, um, which I thought was a really interesting contrast to, to uh, New York. Um, something I picked up on there was the way that the vents uh, were used by the homeless people. And I think in New York, you know, you, you see a lot of tourists using them. These are very uh, iconic features um, uh, in terms of the, the smoke they generate and a lot of street photographers use them for that. But actually, um, you know, they, they, they have this very practical and alternative use providing, um, providing warmth for the homeless. Um, and it, it's something that, you know, I reminded myself to keep an eye out and work into other projects. This, um, it, it's not something I had seen in New York, but it is, it is um, more common there as well. Um, I've seen, you know, uh, the kind of mysterious smoky figure shots using these. Um, so I thought this was kind of a more somber uh, angle of, of the same thing. Um, although the homeless situation is, is pretty bad throughout America, I think just this small difference between the way you you kind of associate vents um, in New York as this kind of romantic idea, um, and in Philadelphia where there's you know a lot of people using them like this, um, it's it it's it's more on the edges of New York, you know, where where they're where where the homeless will use them like this, uh, where fewer people you know fewer tourists are using the vents for their for their smoky photographs, you know. Um, Washington DC was the main focus of my trip. The main um, aspect of my project that I wanted to be photographing with my time here was around the inauguration. Um, the, the entire purpose behind my travel, the way I, I started my plans for this trip specifically to work on this aspect of my project. The moment I saw the, um, the news break that um, uh, Joe Biden had been uh, elected um, but instead of arriving into a city of, of kind of celebration and joy because of the events of the 6th, I was arriving to this, you know, the, the city of barricades, barbed wire, thousands of soldiers. Um, I made my decision to travel light. I took 20 rolls and all of the cameras and lenses I mentioned previously. Uh, the capital hub's fairly small, so my first day there I was able to cover quite a fair distance um, just to kind of take it in, take in the new environment, feel out the restrictions and, and kind of understand the terrain I'd be working in because this was you know unprecedented for this for this kind of military op occupation of um of usually just a, a kind of historic city um this photograph uh, i took from my first day which is troop movements i like that they're you know they're the only thing in the scene um it's been cut off by the slide but you've got an american flag at the top which is like uh you know a spot of iconography and you've got the kind of left commuter bike on the right hand side um i, I just thought this was quite a surreal um, seen as most of the images I ended up shooting in DC were. Um, January 20th inauguration day itself, uh, uneventful when compared to the 6th, but the, the space itself was worth documenting. Um, there were small kind of breakouts of, of celebration or commiseration um, around the perimeter wall, which I did my best to cover. And um, everything I'd wanted in terms of atmosphere and iconography was really essential um, with the, the, the flags, the soldiers, uh, other members of the press, the crowds, the city itself. Um, you know, I, I walked a few dozen kilometers around a very small area just in the one day. I was kind of visiting and revisiting these same landmark locations and situations that, that were happening uh, dotted around the different checkpoints around the capital. Um, one of the situations I liked most was this photograph. I think I took three photographs of this scene and this is probably the, the, uh, the best one of that. Um, You've got the, the woman leaning on the pole who's, who's watching uh, the news on her phone of what's going on only a few hundred meters away. Um, you've got the layout in the background with the, the soldiers behind the perimeter wall. You've got the police officer in the mid ground. And then the moment is that the, um, the kind of police tape had started to come undone and was blowing around her in the wind. And it kind of wrapped into her. You can see it coming out from the bottom of her coat. And she's kind of become one with that scene um, without really knowing or caring because she's so engrossed in the, in the news. Um, what I think is especially images about photographs like this that I took on the day is that there's nothing kind of explicitly political about this photograph, but the, the value of this image is simply, 
you know, the nature of being shot on this very specific day at this very specific time in this very specific space. Um, there were, you know, maybe 50 to 100 photographers that I was walking past, but they were looking for, for very different things than I was. Um, and honestly, for, for, for an event of this size, 100 photographers isn't actually that many. Um, you know, a lot of them were focusing on the, the kind of more pressy shots of the, of the soldiers, the barbed wire, the celebrations, whereas the smaller kind of periphery moments like this is what took my interest. Um, I know based on what I've seen from everyone or from as many people that I could find from that day is that, you know, people did come away with different things. Uh, I, I paid very close attention to the kind of stories that were being told so that I knew kind of what direction I would be taking mine in so that it was something a bit fresh. Um, and luckily there is such a diverse selection. Um, and luckily we did all find something different. Uh, a few other photographs from that day, this is a detailed shot of a, a boarded up Wells Fargo where they've, they've left the hatches open for access to the banks, but you can see they were kind of anticipating something that day, uh, but luckily nothing happened. Um, I was playing, paying close attention to the, the kind of small gatherings of the celebrations and the, the flags and iconography were worthwhile, but it was really about the people, which is why in this photograph, I focused on the hand moving through the flag rather than the flag itself or any other aspect of the character. It's that interaction between the, you know, the person and the moment of, of kind of patriotism and respect for their country. Um, during the next day, uh, so the day after the inauguration, I spent some time with that representative who I mentioned earlier, I'd been arranging this kind of day of shadowing with his PR team um, this is the DC representative Oya Owalewa, which I hope I'm pr pronouncing correctly. Um, he has a really interesting role because DC isn't, isn't technically a state, so he's not really a member of Congress, but he still has this kind of representational role. Um, he's a really lovely guy, and I, I spent um, the, middle, the middle part of my day photographing him while he was working. It was really interesting hearing him talk about, um, you know, the different things that had happened to his city. Uh, in, in the process of, uh, you know, preparing for the, for the day of the inauguration um, and some of the things that he was overseeing and, and kind of planning for, for future events. Um, this is a portrait of him. Um, he's, he's reading on something on his laptop, but the, the detail here, which is quite subtle, is there's this kind of line above his ear moving down his cheek. Um, and that's the result of continued mask wearing. Um, I don't think that this is a specific detail that I've captured before, but I think, uh, you know, once you know what it is, I think it says a lot about the context this photograph was made in. Um, and uh, as I joked before, you know, I'm, I'm not one to go on about gear, but this photograph was made with a 90 millimeter APO lens. And, you know, without the micro contrast that that offers, the, this kind of detail would probably be lost because it's quite subtle. Um, so yeah, my, my favorite lens to those who, who don't know that already. Um, after my time with the representative, I walked over to the field of flags, which I now had access to, whereas previously it had been blocked off because it was, uh, you know, in the middle of the, the perimeter wall. Um, I spent a lot of resources documenting this space because, uh, you know, uh, it's, it's, for those of you who don't know, it was a, a kind of landmark that was set up. Each flag represents, um, you know, the people who couldn't make it to DC because of the pandemic. So the, the way that the flags were representation of the people and, and the kind of symbolism of that. And then what was happening was people, the, the kinds of residents who lived nearby now had access to this field and they were walking along kind of picking the flags out of the earth. Um, uh, and eventually they, they did pick it clean so there were no flags left. And watching this kind of, almost like a, like a live um, performance art, but not really because it's just people doing what's natural is, is kind of they're taking you know, that piece of themselves from this space. Um, the field of flags was definitely one of the icons of the inauguration um, and there were so many photographs of it you know in its glory but the, what there weren't so many photographs of was the the process of it being taken down um, i was lucky with this in that i had access to this space uh, it was a very limited situation it was a very limited amount of time it was maybe you know two or three hours before all of these flags were gone um, and i was take, trying to do my best to take full advantage of that um, as the locals were, were coming in, taking the flags, you know, um, whether they were taking them as souvenirs or, or as a piece of history, but, but you know, that I saw it as they were, they were taking their own American identity, you know, and um, I'm sure the ones who sold them on eBay, we won't talk about those. Um, but it, it was an incredible space to, to be in and to photograph. Um, and the images that I have from it, although I, I did make a pretty big mistake 
um, while photographing this, um, the images that survived um, are fairly decent. For, the, for this project overall, the American flag is a, an absolutely critical piece of iconography, um, especially in the way that it relates to, to kind of patriotism and the American identity. So, you know, capturing the symbolism here, uh, I'm, I'm really happy I had that chance. Um, this frame is, is of the National Guardsmen coming in and, and kind of, um, they would gather, you know, as many armfuls of the American flag as possible, but then some of them would also try and get their own state flag because there are, you know, each uh, state has its own flag. Um, so yeah, th this photograph with, with the layers of the, uh, the layers of the officers, the, just the number of flags that this uh, woman's gathered and the fact that she's gone for her own state flag, she's got a few maybe for, you know, family members to give them out to. I thought that was quite nice. Um, I thought the body language in this photograph was quite interesting. She's kind of walking along like a combine harvester, just, you know, picking them up as she goes. Um, uh, and I, I, I like the way that the, the kind of movement, I like that she's got her phone in her hand because this is all about, you know, the, the broadcast of this situation that people were finding themselves in. Um, later on, I visited the monuments. And again, this is more than just um, about photographing kind of touristy photographs, but this is about incorporating the situation itself. Um, this kind of changing landscape, the presence of the military force, um, which meant I was looking for a way to photograph the National Guard as part of the landscape, not separate from it. Um, the photograph on this slide, I think, is uh, my best example of that. Um, it has the, the layers with the foreground soldier um, who's deliberately out of focus. As far as I'm remembering, this was at F-16 at 90 millimeter on HP-5 pushed. Um, he's, he's out of focus, but it's clear enough that he's there. The, you know, the icon of him, of the gun, of the, the um, head mounted unit he has. Um, he was about a meter away from me so that I could fill the frame. Uh, then I incorporated the monument at eye level by crouching down, tilted a little bit so that there would be uh, people in the kind of triangle that's made by his gun at the uh, lower half of the frame. Um, you know, I have my issues with the image to, you know, if you really have to pick it apart, but it is one of my stronger ones from the project overall. And I think it's definitely one of the more iconic images I've made to date just because it contains such, you know, recognizable icons. Um, what I also like about this is that it is so much, you know, on the edge of being just a tourist photo or a street photograph. Um, you know, you could imagine this photograph taken uh, and instead of the guardsman, it's just a, a different silhouetted figure and it would have the same aesthetic, but this, this military iconography being present, the barrel of the gun extending over the people, um, that's what sets it apart. The, the value of street photography is in practicing, seeing the potential for this photograph and then putting it into practice in this documentary setting is, is you know, the, the real application of, of those techniques. Um, while I was in Bulgaria, I was very disappointed while watching things unfold in the States, uh, especially when they had that uh, early blizzard. Um, many others managed to enjoy that, but I was very jealous because snow's pretty much my favorite weather. Um, as time went on back in New York, uh, it, it uh, returned to those kind of icy conditions. At one point, the, the kind of real field temperature was minus 16, um, and that was made a lot worse by the kind of wind tunnel created by the buildings there. Um, on that day, the, the rubber of my shoe actually cracked all the way through, which this on the left is a photograph of. Um, that's since been replaced, thankfully. Um, but during this kind of very cold conditions with no snow, I was able to make um, some really interesting still lifes, which I don't normally do, of, of these artifacts that had been, um, you know, mainly rubbish that had accumulated in puzzles, puddles, which had then frozen over. Um, I thought there were some really poignant ideas to be found um, in these still lifes, especially as, you know, the, th this idea of things being preserved in the ice is, is I feel close to what I'm doing with photography in general. So there were some nice poet, poetic images I could create with that. Um, the newspaper photograph on the right of this slide being one of them with, with the, you know, it's got the headline, you can read what's going on, but it's also got this kind of frozen, um, morbid feel about it. Um, a few days after I took that photograph, uh, the East Coast was hit by Storm Olena, which meant a lot of snow, which was wonderful. Um, the conditions were actually absolutely, absolutely incredible. Uh, the deepest snow I've ever been in, uh, you know, even the worst conditions we get here in London uh, are nothing compared to what they had there. Um, initially, this meant I was trapped in uh, New Jersey, so I was spending time in that area. Uh, as soon as the NJ, uh, as soon as the NJ uh, transit system opened again, I was able to spend as much time in New York as possible. Uh, these photographs are both taken in New Jersey, uh, in the local area where I was staying. 
On the right, it's a, uh, a birdhouse by a lake just as the snow is beginning. And on the left is a man digging out his car. Um, one of the photographers I'd met um, on the sixth pool uh, tipped me off that there was going to be a, a huge community snowball fight in Washington Square Park. Uh, so I, I arrived quite early to that. Um, my method for shooting that was one camera, a 35 millimeter lens and HP5. Uh, it was a, a lovely overcast day. So I was able to meet at once and work with those settings in the same. Uh, I zone focused throughout the whole thing and you know, ran around a lot. Um, it was quite a difficult condition to work in. Everyone uh, tended to target the press, which I, I find um, whether it's you know, a harmless noble fight or, or more aggressive situations, but it was, it was nice in this situation. Um, I know that all of the photographs I came away from from this that are any good, I worked hard for, and there are a few that I'm very happy with. So the payoff there was was really nice. Um, I haven't shown my favourites from this snowball fight anywhere other than in print so far, which is something I'll be discussing at the end. Um, but there is a longer account of my uh, photographs in the snowball fight, also on 35 MMC, uh, which is where I wrote the. Uh, parking lot hockey article as well so if people are interested in my process uh, for photographing this situation it's written up there. Um, photographing in the snow really was a highlight of the of this trip um, and definitely a situation I'd love to repeat. Uh, one of the days I spent in Central Park only with a 50 mil uh, which gave me some lovely results. At one point uh, in the afternoon a hawk came down to land and started eating a pigeon which it had caught. Um, now with 50 millimeters, there's only so much you can do from a distance, so you need to get closer. The, um, the bottom right photo on this slide is a, is a photograph of me, you know, after, after having approached the hawk to photograph it, I had to climb over a fence um, and went and sat about a meter away, uh, which allowed me to include a little bit more context of the, the kind of park architecture. I think anyone familiar with uh, Central Park will recognize Bethesda Terrace. Um, so yeah, anyone who tells you that you can't photograph wildlife using a, a rangefinder on a 50 millimeter is both wrong and lazy. Um, later on, after sunset on the same day, I photographed this. Uh, it's a figure in an open field surrounded by snow with the city as the backdrop, um, which provided me with enough ambient light to make an exposure at 1 15th of a second. Um, photographs like this on the surface level, are, you know, it's a nice aesthetic street photograph essentially. It doesn't really have a lot of storytelling depth or potential to be included in my project um, until you realize that there's actually something terribly wrong and it's not especially subtle in this photograph. Um, but it's only something I realized when I looked at this photograph later on um, blown up larger is that just the sheer number of lights that are switched off. You know, this is New York. This is the city that never sleeps. Um, in all my time in the city, I've never seen it with this few lights on. And I think, you know, all of these empty offices, all of these empty apartments, um, the situation that, that causes that to happen, um, people just aren't in these spaces. Uh, and I think once you realize that context, it's actually quite a surreal backdrop to this photograph. Um, working with curation in mind for a project, for, for a project like this, where I kind of have an idea of where I want it to go, I'm always, taking my time to curate. I'm always thinking about my images as drafts and how they're going to be presented in print. Um, the photographs that I've shown here and the, the rest of the photographs in my project um, are the result of an approach which isn't just taking the world as it comes at me, but it's, it's a more careful and more decisive application of my time. Even though earlier I said it's about wasting time, that's you know a decided waste of my time, if that makes sense. Um, even if the decision for my day is chosen that this day I'm gonna be open to failure, it'll still take the project to where it needs to be. Um, as I'm working, as things are unfolding, I have the context of what's happening around me. Uh, I know I have the context of the images I've photographed during previous trips. I've got images that I know I photographed during this trip and I know that there are images, there's the potential for them, which I know are gonna be important, which means that when I'm walking around, I'm able to identify this potential in the scenes I would otherwise walk by and the value comes from this understanding of the way that I'm working, you know, when it's it's going to be presented in print, which means I'm looking for ideas to be paired with other ideas, not necessarily images where, you know, every single photograph can be aesthetically strong and independent of anything else. The whole point of a project is that these images aren't independent of each other. Um, what I'm ultimately working towards with this is to produce a narrative which has this kind of organic and logical flow from one image and one page to the next, but while still designed around the narrative that I'm you know, piecing together as I go. 
um, this means that as I'm working, you're working with the hindsight of the work that you've already produced. Um, and this, you know, you, you can you can do that in reference to things I've discussed in previous webinars like diptychs. You can do it entirely organically with one offs. Um, but importantly, what it means is that you're not looking at these things as separate situations. It means that the the snowball fight in New York is as important to the project as the soldiers in DC and as the hawk in Central Park. It all becomes part of this narrative. Um, I think that the best part of documentary storytelling, which I think separates it from the kind of reportage photojournalism, is that I can take, you know, a step or many steps backwards away from these kind of high energy breaking news type stories and examine these things on my own terms, not needing to respond to breaking news quickly while events are still in motion. Because, you know, if you photograph a story and you're fixated just on that story, you're going to miss the context, you're going to miss the detail. And that's what I was spending most of my time trying to pick up on. Um, sharing my photographs from this project through the presentation so far, I've shown a selection of images which I think are kind of decent B-roll or transitional images, and only a couple which I think are going to be with these kind of breakout images from the project. Um, the more I'm working on these kinds of projects, the more I distance myself from sharing huge amounts of work online, even when it comes to uh, the kind of educational settings like these academy webinars. Um, you know, I probably have given away too much during this presentation, but even then it's not the entire thing. It's only a few days worth of images from the overall project, which realistically is a few years away from being where I want it to be. Um, I haven't shown the best images because those are reserved for print. And hopefully as the project continues to grow over time, the, the best are yet to, yet to come. Um, the photographs that I've shown so far are representative of the project so far, but without the sequencing, without the accompanying write up, they're just photographs. Um, but I imagine that's what many of you are tuning in to learn about. Uh, I think it's necessary to share some of what it is that I'm working on because it does maintain my ability to work on these projects. Uh, what I've done specifically for this one and something I'm working on for others is to publish a short run uh, of a selection of 31 images um, in a 36 page zine, which is currently available um, as this kind of digest style publication, which I have here. Um, the funding from these will go towards this project and others. Uh, I find that part of photography and part of the photography community is the need for this kind of mutual advocacy when it comes to projects, um, which does mean sharing work, not necessarily holding back everything, even if it's a sneak peek of what's being worked on. Uh, I think most people do this on social media, uh, but I think there's more value in keeping it exclusive and in print so that there's an intrinsic value to enjoying those photographs in the, the body of the publication itself. Um, even of these 31 photographs I have in print, uh, I haven't shown the majority of them. I think only one or two of them appeared in this presentation. Um, so there's still surprises remaining for the project. Um, for example, I think the photograph where it was the, the woman who's kind of wrapped with the, the police tape in DC, there's an ultimate frame in this. Um, so compared to what's actually gonna end up in print, uh, you know, I, I still leave the best. Um, you can find a link to that digest if you're interested in my Instagram bio. Uh, my Instagram's at simonking underscore v. Um, what I find important that I haven't done with this project, which is essential, is to, to just throw these images away by sharing them on social media. It's very, very different to present these things in this webinar format or in an article than to use a photograph as social media content. Um, and I have an upcoming webinar that I've been working on on exactly this topic. Um, so if you're interested in that, uh, it's going to be called Escaping the Social Media Bubble. Um, you know, it'll be about doing something worthwhile with your photographs, something that you, you know, wait to have value over them, not just to use them as someone else's advertising content. Um, the, the best photograph from the hockey game, for example, uh, and my two favourite photographs from the snowball fight, those don't exist anywhere other than this publication currently, um, and I'd have it no other way, because it... Um, it essentially damages my ability to talk about those photographs to discuss them um, because most won't have seen them because they're only available in the zine. But what it does do is offer those photographs value and that value would be diluted if they were available digitally either in the webinar or on social media. Um, because the photographs aren't worthless to me, um, I would be doing them a disservice by just giving them away. And because I think they're worth it, I think that you know that value is maintained because you can't find it anywhere else, not digitally. Um, 
I'm looking at producing darkroom prints from the project so far, at which point I would set, share aspects of the print itself, but you know that would give the image away as well, so I'm waiting for that. Um, and again, if this is an idea that you'd like to hear more about, you're welcome to join me on that webinar, which we haven't yet booked a date for it yet, but I'm, I'm sure that will be upcoming. Um, and that webinar will also be a return to kind of my more theory and philosoph philosophical based ideas. Um, but also, as I said at the start of this presentation, if you'd enjoy, if you've enjoyed hearing the way I discuss working on projects about this project, I can also talk about my approach for some of the other projects I've been working on. Um, I think what would be interesting is maybe some of my fashion BTS work, um, some of my other documentary based projects, but not necessarily my street pho photography stuff. But if you guys want to get in contact with us and let us know you're interested in that, then I can work on those. Um, I've also noted that there's some incredible in-person masterclasses returning to the Leica Academy. Uh, hopefully I'll be offering something through the summer, but that's still to be arranged. Um, but you should check out what's currently on the Academy website and keep an eye for anything new. Um, I'm happy to take questions from anyone who has any kind of questions about this. And again, sorry for stumbling a few times there, uh, but I'm not used to talking about my work as my work. <laughs> I mean, I for one certainly enjoy hearing about your process. Um, and actually, there's already a, a couple of questions in. And actually, I, I literally honestly can't, can't wait to see the, the actual finished project. If you're saying majority of those images are B-roll, wow, you must have some really great images in the bank. I like to think so. Um, um, I can, I'm happy to answer the, the questions and then I'm sure others are coming in. Yeah, there's a, um, there's, there was one um, comment I just saw in the chat feed. Um, it's just more out of intrigue. Where was it? Um, one of the images, New Year's Day, um, Asbury Park. Is that the image of the people running into the, the water, was it? Um, yes. Ah, so there was a, 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 um, a kind of defect with the images taken on that morning because of the cold. Let me find it. Yes, because of the, the extremely cold weather and because um, I hadn't CLA'd this particular camera in a while, um, I think there was some shutter drag on some of the photographs, but luckily not many of them. Uh, I don't think it takes away too much from the image overall. I think it um, adds to the image personally. Yeah, there's there's a, a kind of vibe to it, but yeah, it's, it's not intentional um, and something I didn't realise until I actually developed the work. Um, I know that there are options for film cameras to get a, a kind of cold weather lubrication applied, um, but it's not something I'd really looked into too much before seeing these negatives. Um, I don't tend to like the kind of spontaneous accidents that can happen with film. I like it to look the way I want it to look. And then if I'm going to make a deliberate accident, then I'll do that on my own terms. Um, but yeah, that's um, caused by shutter problems, uh, which were caused by the cold weather and it only appeared on the, on um, I think this was one of the first photographs I took that day. So um, because it was one of the first ones, the shutter hadn't kind of warmed up, if that makes sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, whereas late, later on images on this day didn't have that. Um, it's nothing specific to Leica, <laughs> if that's an issue. Um, this can be remedied with a, with a CLA, with the, with the cold weather lubrication, but you just have to keep that in mind if you're going to be using uh, a film M in very cold conditions. Good advice. Um, I'll click through to the chat, uh, to the Q&A box now. Yeah, um, um, I'll start with a question from Nigel that was just asking okay. whether the trip was the result of a commission or a self-driven project. Ah, great question. Um, I will always do my best to try and have both. So if I line up something uh, personal, then I'll always try and find some commissions in the area to work on as, as well. And you know, if I'm working on a commission, then I can always work on my personal work to and from that. Um, with this trip, because I was setting things up with, you know, different representatives, um, different kind of individual characters, I was able to find, um, you know, off the back of that pitch to them and off the back of that access to them, I was able to pitch those photographs that I knew I would have to other people who might be interested in them. Um, you know, sometimes if I'm, if I'm traveling, I'll reach out to people and, and, do kind of more commercially driven shoots but because I really wanted this to be entirely off on the nature of this um, project about documenting um, you know this time this place in the cool zone as it were um, I, I didn't want to take away from that so I would only look at commissions 
based on things I'd already prearranged. Hopefully that answers the question. Yeah, thank you. Um, Miguel asks, what resources did you wish you had on and after the 6th of January? So on the 6th, uh, probably some kind of teleportation machine uh, <laughs> or foresight or more research. Um, but you know, hindsight is always going to give you so many, um, so many different things that you could potentially work on. So I, I would rather have had the experience that I had and learn from it in terms of, you know, research more, um, build better connections with the photographic community so that you can better share tips, um, you know, ideas like that. But you'll you'll never truly be able to preempt, um, you know, incredible spontaneous happenings like that. So, you know, it, it's all very well to talk about things in hindsight, but realistically things worked out the way they did and my project will be based off the back of that not off photographs you know i wish i'd taken or wish i hadn't taken in, in um the event of some of those photographs being more you know traumatic and horrific um but still incredible photographs thank you um question here from jonathan what do you scan your film negatives uh, i have a plus tech 8100 for scanning the negatives directly. And then sometimes I'll scan um, darkroom prints, which I haven't done for this project yet, but with that, um, any flatbed scanner will do. Thank you. Um, Mike notices a lot of grain in some of your images. Is this just a result of pushing the film or is it a deliberate strategy to create atmosphere in brackets, which it certainly achieves? Um, some of the photographs I've shown um, including the one that's currently on screen of the ripped flag, uh, were taken on a very, very deeply expired Neopan 1600 film, um, which has very, very blocky grain um, as a result of the expiration. Normally, uh, I'll be shooting, so all of the stuff I photographed in DC, aside from I think one roll was HP5, uh, pushed to 800 or 1600. Um, Grain as an aesthetic decision isn't one I tend to make. The decisions I make when pushing and pulling and doing different things to film will always be based on, you know, what's available in terms of light. What do I actually need to photograph at in order to make an exposure? And then uh, any grain from that will be incidental. All of my um, black and white film is stand developed um, in something like Rodinal um, or Paranol S or something like that. Um, which does have a, a, a grainier look to it, but I mainly use it because it's predictable and I know exactly what I need to do to it. Um, if you Google my name and stand development with Rodinald, you'll find an article I've written about that process. Um, but yeah, the, the grain is incidental and I don't mind massively that there's huge differences between, you know, the, those 1600 photographs and, and anything shot at like Delta 100. I don't, they, they don't, look bad next to each other in print it doesn't matter as much because when you're looking at on the paper you're not looking at um grain you're not looking at pixels you're looking at pigment um you know you're looking at fabric um which is you know as an aside to rant for a moment when people talk to me about histograms if you're looking at a print you're not looking at a histogram you're looking at you know paper and ink and a photograph the way it, it wants to be shown in print um not that that rant is directed at you. <laughs> <laughs> well, very interesting. I mean, I completely understand what you're saying, but that, uh, the aesthetic, the resulting aesthetic certainly adds something to the images. Um, there's a couple of questions from Des. One with regards to your favorite 90 mil. Could you give us a little more um, with regards to why you love the 90 APO in comparison to like a regular Summicron? Um, without getting too much into the, the kind of technical lens aspects, because I have given a talk on um, using telephoto lenses in the past, and I think that can be found on YouTube if you, um, if you search for my name and telephoto like a webinar, I think. Um, the reason I like the APO over the regular Summicron is because it, it does render in more detail. And when you're photographing on an inherently soft medium, which film does tend to be, it'll render in a way that um, some lenses cannot. For example, the one with the 
uh, the representative with the with the mask line. It's a really beautiful portrait. Um, thank you so much. Um, I don't know. I don't have enough experience with regular Simicrons to know whether or not they would render that level of micro contrast, but I wouldn't want to leave it to chance when there's also the possibility of losing that detail in the development or in the scan or in the print. So I need to make sure it's there. Um, I don't use apochromatically corrected lenses as any of my other lenses, just my 90, but that is my most commonly used lens. Um, I think Robin, if you have any input on the difference between apochromatic correction and non um, for, the, for the options of like lenses, people might be interested in that. Well, yeah, I mean, basically it's just backing at what you're saying. It does pick up more contrast and micro contrast than a non APO lens would. Um, so yeah, just to back up what you're saying. I also, I also think that um, because apochromatic correction is more of a thing in color photography because people find it prevents kind of red and purple fringing, um, to use it in black and white settings is, is um, kind of an odd choice to some, but actually that red and purple fringing can still happen in black and white, it'll just look like a glow. Um, I don't so much care about that glow because I stand develop and I tend to get a glow around highlights anyway. Um, but if you are, if you, if you do photograph in color, either digitally or in film, then the, the APO lenses would be something to look at if you really want kind of the finest detail available. It's, it's, um, it's, it must be so difficult from a, from a marketing standpoint when it comes to the lenses, because the difference is, you know, they're both, both the APO and non-APO versions of the lens will be the finest glass available. The difference is incremental, but you know, if you know you need it, then you need it, I guess. Yeah, that's well said. Um, and Des's other question was, he, well, first of all, it's a statement. He says he loves the, the single man in snow and cranes, Thank Liberty, you. particularly the latter, presumably on very slow speed, shutter speeds. Um, the, the figure in the snow with the light, I think that was either at one eighth or one fifteenth of a second. Um, and I was shivering, so it is slightly out. Um, but it, but it's clear enough and that's what matters, you know, it, again, the, the kind of paradox of using the sharpest lenses available, but while also not really caring that much if things are actually sharp. Uh, but again, when you're looking at these things in print, as long as they make sense, as long as the, the, the atmosphere, as long as the feeling is there in the photograph, then that is all that matters. Um, the photograph of the Statue of Liberty was taken on a higher shutter speed um, because of the sunlight, but I, I, I did like the, um, where's that one, this one? I liked the, the sunlight poking through because, because of the kind of brighter future statue looking towards it kind of feeling to it. But no, this was a um, definitely either a thousandth of a second or, or 500, you know, stop right down. All right, thank you. Um, Nigel's asked, can you talk about why you chose to shoot your documentary work on film? I shoot all of my work on film for many reasons. Uh, when I say all of my work, I mean all of my important work, all of my commercial work I shoot on digital because the turnaround time needs to be faster. Um, for projects where I'm investing my life, uh, you know, which, which are the best projects will be. Um, I want the result to be something, first of all, physical that I that I can keep and that I can keep track of in terms of a physical file, because I don't think that there's a proper digital storage solution for, you know, e even if I'm shooting as many digital files as I am film, I like to be able to find those things physically, have them marked out, than to go in a folder of a folder of a folder and, and find some file name, of, which is already a backup of a backup of a copy that was copied off the SD card originally, you know, it, it, it loses something along all those copies. You know, I really think it does. Um, it also forces me to think in a certain way. It forces me to shoot in a certain way. Um, and not necessarily a way that, that is kind of aesthetic or even bound by the limitations of the quantity, but more, you know, I'm, I'm focusing on what's in front of me. I'm not focusing on my camera. I'm not focusing on, um, looking at the photograph I just took, there's only ever the next photograph. You know, I, I can't think about what I've made so far that day, which means that I could lose everything, but as long as I get that next shot right, you know, that's that's something that film gives my workflow. Um, and, and yeah, many other reasons, but uh, I think again, I've, I've, I've written a lot of articles on this, but I'm happy to um, do a webinar on this topic if people are interested in it. 
Well, so actually, it's, and it's interesting that, um, you know, Leica brought out the, the MD camera, mm. which is kind of a step to get a digital camera back towards the philosophy of film shooting, which is kind of, in a way, something that you were just touching on. In terms of the being able to being able to focus on the photography, not on the yeah. camera, yes. In terms of the physicality, we can argue about that later. Yeah, sure. <laughs> um, but what is lovely is that, you know, nothing's replaced the MP and the MA options. It, it's not like the MD came in and said film's no longer anything, because then I think you would lose a lot of, you know, people who are interested in Leica because of, of what it offers to, you know, the very specific purpose of documentary photography on film. Um, because they are some of the, the finest tools for that. Yeah, thank you. Um, Didn't mean to bite at you, Robin. <laughs> not at all, no offense taken. I, I mean, for me, they're just two very different mediums. Mm. Um, anonymous attendee here saying, how did you, do you go about choosing the paper stock in print your project onto? Um, the answer to that is experience and samples. Um, whoever you're printing with, I use a company called Mixum, who are great. They, they print almost everything I would want them to. Uh, what they don't do is very, very large, like A2 sized big books that you have to really like work on, but I'll, I'll bully them into offering that to me. Um, in terms of the actual paper stock, uh, my personal preference is a matte, um, a, a, a very kind of light absorbing paper because I don't want, um, you know, in the, in the same way that a, a phone screen is producing light. I don't think that a photograph produces light. I think it should reflect light. I think you should look at it like in a gallery in a book setting, um, which means that if you're using kind of uh, glossy or, or even some of the kind of shinier silk options, um, it's, it's going to be this very harsh effect when you're looking at the page um, and very difficult to actually sometimes, you know, see the detail. Whereas when you're looking at matte, uh, you know, the, the, the kind of boldest mat you can get is canvas, I think. I, that's pr print snobs will probably tell me I'm completely wrong, but in terms of the way I feel the paper, the, the texture to it, the way that the ink sinks into it, I want something to be very fibrous. Um, and that, that's personal preference. You know, if you want a very shiny, if you want to print on metal, if you want to print on tin, um, all of those things are open to you, but you, I think you have to go through practice. You have to go through experimentation to find out okay, you know, this photograph or landscape doesn't really work on, you know, 300 GSM Xerox, but it does work fantastically on, you know, a very thin paper just because the light does shine through it and you can see more detail that way. There, there'll, there'll always be something specific to the way you want to see your work. Um, but never make a decision based on print, based on what someone else does, you know? You should always do test prints. Good advice. Um, question here from Ian asks, when you embark on a project or idea that may last for a number of months or even longer, do you try and have a full or complete idea of the areas you wish to cover from the outset or do you go with it and keep flexible? And if the story then takes you on one way, then do you go with it or try to stick true to the initial plan? That's a great question and almost entirely answered by the way I formatted the uh, webinar in that this wasn't, you know, I didn't have a clear picture of what was going on. I just knew that I needed to be in America for the inauguration. That was that was kind of my my fulcrum, you know. Everything else revolved around that. Um, if if you have a very very clear idea, then I would say that you're a designer. You know, you you have the kind of specifications outlined. You have a character, a place, a setting, a situation. You go and photograph those things. You know what it looks like. There's not really a lot of artistry, and there's not really a lot of potential to dedicate years, because, you know, if I'd started working on a project two years ago, which I have done, that would be affected by the you know the global pandemic situation, and and political situation. Um, an interpersonal situation that those that causes you can't account for that so even if you have the best idea of what you want to cover from the outset it will always be thrown back in your face um, I think that the most effective way to work is to have an idea of a beginning of a story you know a thread that you're going to pull on and then in the course of unraveling that thread you'll find others you'll find branches you'll find you know things that take your attention you know maybe you'll find new projects maybe you'll realize that your original project actually is something else you know um but i don't think that it's necessarily the best thing to 
decide on a project, shoot that project, and then have exactly what you expected. Because if you do that, then you haven't really learned anything new, you know, if you meet your expectations. And I also think that if you're going to do a project for months, which I would still call a short term project, I think that the long term projects, which take years to, to really watch a situation unfold in a in a in a in an organic way to watch over years you'll never know what's going to happen next um and i don't think it's worth spending years on something where you already have the answers i would only direct years of years or months of my life into projects where i don't know where it's going to happen uh, sorry where i don't know where it's going to end up so that when i actually do have the finished publication it's something that people are actually interested in because no one knew where it was going to go Interesting. So the, the narrative is, is very much being kind of made up as you go along with the project and also, I suppose, in the editing. So the, the, the narrative doesn't necessarily depend on me. The narrative depends on everyone else. You know, I'm going to put myself into situations where I've. So I decided the 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 title of this project, which, again, it didn't start with it. Stood, it, it didn't start with the title of the cool zone. The cool zone represents this idea of. Uh, a, a, a place and time in history which is um, cool to hear about, cool to read about, but not necessarily cool to live in. And the reason I chose that title is because things changed, you know? It was originally going to be a project on, um, you know, I, I really love the American identity, that this kind of patriotism done correctly, not to the extreme level, but, but a love of what a country could be. I think that America embodies that in so many ways that are correct, in so many ways that, you know, maybe not necessarily incorrect, but just a, a darker path, you know? Um, and I think that exploring those ideas is something that many people are doing, but I'd like to also have a look at my own ideas, which means that I'm going to put myself into situations where I see those things on display, where I see these communities, you know, advocating for each other, where I see um, these icons and how they're used, how they're displayed. Um, and, and, and then when I look back, I'll then be able to piece together and go, OK, well, here's what I learned about this. Here's how this state does this. Here's what the flag means to these people. Here's what the military means to these people. Here's how it affects, um, you know, people going to the shops. Here's, you know, daily life. Here's how it affects this. But you have, have, starting with, a, with an overarching theme, even that will be, you know, even that can change course, you know, over time. Um, so it's not necessarily that I'm doing anything to the narrative, but it's that process of discovery and uncertainty that I'm, you know, learning about these things and then regurgitate that information as education to the people who are reading my publications. They can absorb something they didn't have already. So as long as things are new to me, they are probably worth being in the final cut. Interesting, thank you. Um, what should we do next? Miguel, your accounts of DC appear to have an underlying tension, understandably so. Can you share how you navigated that setting in contrast, for example, with your more energetic accounts of London protests? DC was really, really fascinating and I did my absolute best to try and put some of that into the photographs. Um, there was a lot going on in terms of, you know, this space had been occupied by the military. It had been, um, you know, almost uh, invaded on the home turf, as it were, almost a month previous to me photographing there. So there is this, this tension and this distrust. And there's, you know, a lot of the photographers who were attending had this kind of, you know, they, they were parachuting in and, and hoping for something to go wrong like it had done so they could repeat that. Whereas I was actually looking for um, the, you know, the community response, the iconography, the patriotism that was on display in terms of stepping up after such an event. Um, in the time that I was there, things were moving quite slowly. Um, some area, areas were restricted to me, others weren't. The areas that uh, the press were photographing in so things like you know that the hand on the bible and the walking up the stairs of the capital uh, of the actual swearing in ceremony those were pretty much not interesting to me at all because first of all those people who had invested in in all the press kit that could photograph those things from a long way away they were going to get those shots i never was going to but also i don't particularly find them interesting because they're you know it's it's a performative action uh it's a ritual it's a ceremony but not 
where you know ordinary people will learn something from it you know so so I, I didn't find any value there um I wouldn't compare it at all to kind of energetic London protests that's a completely different vibe where my considerations for things like personal safety safety of my colleagues um what photographs I'm looking for what kind of situations I'm going to put myself in to get those photographs so those were completely different um the National Guardsmen, you know, my, my opinions on the military and different areas of the military aside, my understanding of the National Guard is that they're close to kind of what we have in Britain is the Territorial Army, which is a, kind of a, a more casual, more um, friendly-ish approach to, to people, who, you know, compared to some of the, you know, like hardcore Marines. So I did have a few... Um, you know, lovely conversations with the National Guardsmen. I was wearing a very thick, fluffy, uh, friendly sweater, which is a technique I learned from Emily Garthway, because, you know, but, but she's tiny, so she, you know, it's, it's very um, disarming to be a kind of small person with a small camera and a, and a lovely thick jumper. You know, you're, you're just not putting out any any kind of offensive or, or, or dangerous vibes, you know? Um, because I, I, and then on top of that, the I have a, you know, British accent. I don't know how well that's um, coming across over Zoom, I tend to hate my voice in recordings, as most people do. But um, you know, in location, chatting to people, they would hear I'm British. They would be interested as to why I was there for, you know, why I wasn't in the the kind of touristy places or the the more, you know, pressy areas and 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 um, like the press pit for the for the actual inauguration stuff. So I think I was more kind of an oddity to them um, than anything uh, worth like serious attention. Um, one of the National Guardsmen, uh, the day after the inauguration, came over to me specifically because of the jumper and asked me if I'd seen the, the meme with Bernie Sanders and the mittens and said that, you know, my coziness reminded him of that. Um, and I had a laugh about, you know, if coziness is a meme in the military, but not for the British. <laughs> um, so, yeah, there, there were some nice interactions and overall it was friendly. Um, the, the most stress I had in DC came from photographing the field of flags because that was such a limited... Um, and, and, and spontaneous thing happening in front of me that I was, you know, I, I ended up rushing, I ended up uh, making some big mistakes. Um, but yeah, that, that was the most stressful situation for me, I think. Sorry that it's not all flashy, um, like the protest work tends to be. Um, but again, possibly down the line, I can do a webinar about London protests, which might be what you want to hear about if you're asking about that in relation to how things were in DC. But I'm not sure if that was kind of the, the subtext of your question. Thank you very much. Um, Bailey is curious about your your opinion on sharing work on Instagram versus keeping it to yourself and working towards a larger project, like you mentioned. Do you think we mindlessly share too much, which ultimately affects our work? Um, well, I guess I'll, I'll be putting the answer in, in the actual webinar I do on the subject of social media, but yes. Um, I think not only do we share too much which affects the work, but I think we share too much, which affects the value of the work. I think that giving stuff away for free can be wonderful, but when you're giving it away in a, in a very, very tiny medium um, on, on someone else's platform, uh, when, I, when I was studying, I, I heard a great quote, which is that um, newspapers are just filler between the adverts. You know, that's what's important. And that's what a lot of social media is. Um, I also think that, that digital sharing in general has less impact than a photograph being its own thing. When you have a print, you know, an individual print or a publication of photographs or of a photograph, that is a photograph. Whereas your phone screen is, you know, messages from your loved ones, also my photographs, also your photographs, also YouTube, you know, anything that you're going to do through the phone. So the value of it is not, this is a photograph, the value of it is one thing in a sea of many other things. You know, the, the, the attention span that I would be competing for by putting my work on social media is so tiny compared to the attention span of, if you're buying my work, you, you know, I, I hope it doesn't just go to prop up a, a table leg, but I don't mind if it does, because that's the value you assign to it. But if you've paid for something, you're going to put intrinsic value in that, and you're going to get something out of it, you know? unless it's terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Um, Nick has a question here. Actually, you also made a comment in the chat feed um, 
very much enjoyed seeing your work and also I'm very much looking forward to your next webinar on social media, which was linked to that previous question. Um, you talked about each frame connecting to the broader story rather than always having to stand alone. When shooting so much, do you keep track of the specific shots you think are key as you go along, or are you just thinking back to the journey as a whole? Um, sometimes things stand out to me. And, and those are the things that I will think about in terms of I can make a diptych out of this thing that I've photographed. And sometimes it's about the overall message. So, you know, a photograph like on the screen here, you know, it, it's, it's a flag that's ripped in the heavy wind. And that obviously has a, a meaning, it's symbolic. Um, so that's a photograph I would take whether or not it relates to anything else. Because it happens to be a flag, if I then find something that's ripped, or if I find a flag that's oriented in a certain way, or if I find a building that does something, or if I find anything that connects to this, I'll photograph it. I don't know about answering the question in terms of the way my memory works, because I think everyone's mind works differently. So we'll, we'll always be thinking about different things and creating different connections. Um, but I don't think that, you know, if, if I'm taking a snapshot if I'm taking any photograph, it's because something about it stood out to me. So I do tend to remember and am able to make those connections. Um, but if you find that difficult, then you know, working with a theme or, or looking at the photographs after they've been printed and taking one with you that you think relates to the story and then finding something that matches to that might be a, a, a way to, for people to work if they don't um, or don't want to remember um, photographs that they've taken. Uh, while I was in Bulgaria, uh, which I have completed a, a, a separate publication for. Um, I photographed a, a bench which had broken and I photographed it just because I was bored. But then later on, I found another, uh, I think a, a broken couch. And I knew that because I'd photographed a broken bench, I could photograph that and there were two broken chairs. Now that's not the most interesting or insightful thing to photograph, but you can draw these connections. You know, you're the artist putting these pieces together. And if they mean something to you, then maybe they do, but that doesn't mean they'll mean something to everyone else. But what matters is that, you know, you, you practice, you find the connections, you figure them out in maybe in existing work. And then from there, when you have the understanding of your work, then you can go and produce more work that relates to that original work. Sorry that that was two answers that, that overlapped. Answered very well, thank you. Um, Francesco loves your work. And very kind. Sorry that I didn't research enough about your art. Would like to ask about your aesthetic and how it's changed over the years. Was your photography very different when you started to be recognised as a photographer? That's a great question, and probably if I ever do a webinar on my early work, which was in the fashion industry, you'll see a lot of very colorful, lovely and sharp fashion portraits, which are completely different to everything I'm doing now with film and documentary work. Although that was the gateway to documentary photography because I would photograph front of house and then I would walk behind the scenes and suddenly there were all these stories and spontaneous things happening that I had no control over. And that was far more interesting to me as an environment to photograph in than the very kind of clinical performative fashion work. Um, in terms of aesthetic, at the moment, my focus isn't on the way my images look, but on what my images contain in terms of storytelling value, which is what I discussed during the semiotic webinar. Um, so yes, my, my aesthetics definitely changed. I started off with more, um, you know, uh, with colorful, uh, you know, beauty, but empty, you know? Whereas now I'm trying to, to put information into frames to describe things, to tell stories. And the effect that that has on my aesthetic is, you know, so many things to list here, but you can imagine, um, you know, just because everything now is on black and white film, that itself is so different to color digital, you know, or even the color film stuff. Um, what might be useful is I started keeping a blog in 2016 uh, which is streetdances.wordpress.com. So if you go all the way back to 2016 um, and then click through, you don't have to read every article, but you should see my images progress uh, and hopefully improve. But who knows? You might like the earlier stuff, but you know everyone likes different things. Um, and I do encourage people to keep journals and notebooks just so that you can reflect on where you've come from, where you're going, um, and and you know how far you've come.
I mean, this project that you, you've been talking about today looks like, to me, a very strong project. Do, do you feel that this is one of your strongest projects? I think that this is a project that will have the deepest meaning to the most people so far because it's such a charged people. You know, it's, it's, it's so many different communities. It's so diverse. It's one of those projects where people look at, you know, America and, you know, they'll go on a road trip or they'll, you know, or they'll go to the, the, the highlights and they still won't scratch the surface. The, the difficulty with the story is knowing where the ending is, you know, is knowing what borders to put around it and go, okay, I'm not going to cover every single family. I'm not going to cover uh, issues on the border. I'm not going to cover, um, you know, droughts. What am I going to cover? And it's this idea of um, identity, which even then it's too broad. So I've got to narrow that down. Um, and I'm still in the process of that and it's going to take time. Um, I would hope that it's not my strongest project. <laughs> you know, I would hope that that's still to come. But I think that through working on so many different projects, like I, just in the UK, I'm working on uh, one to do with the waterways and canal systems, um, one to do with religion and the way that manifests in terms of British identity. Um, these are all powerful ideas, but they'll have different power to different people, you know? Um, because if you live on a barge, you'll be more interested in the waterways project than you will be in the religion one. Um, so yeah, I, 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 I wouldn't be the one to comment on my own work in terms of what I think is powerful. I don't even think that the powerful photographs in this project are ones that necessarily mean the most to me, just because I don't have a huge attachment to America, which means that I'm looking at it as an outsider, which is why my experience living there, um, and hopefully when I return to live there for longer, um, was so interesting to me because I'm viewing things differently. Whereas when I look at the photographs that I make in London, even if they're of different cultures and different people, they'll still have more meaning to me because it, I feel like it's more a part of my life, if that makes sense. And I, I think that the best documentary projects will always come from that aspect of documenting yourself and your life and your experience that no one else can replicate. Um, which I think I kind of touched on during the self-portrait assignment, but yeah. there it is for documentary. Thank you. Um, I think we've pretty much got through. So if there's any last questions, please do quickly write them into the Q&A panel. Um, just a comment more than anything from Des here on just kind of continuing on what we're discussing film. He, he thinks uh, like a, a webinar would be extremely valuable. Um, so a thumbs up for that one too. Okay, I'm happy to do that. I can discuss that with you whenever you're free, Rowan. <laughs> And actually, um, and we, yeah, we, were, we, were, we were discussing uh, potentially a film workshop, so there might be some... Oh, yes, the in-person stuff. Like that. That's right. <laughs> Hopefully that's something that can work out. Yeah, yeah, I hope so. Particularly, as, as you say, things are gradually beginning to open up and mm. we are gradually starting in-person classroom workshops, which is great. Yeah. Well, what I can do is I can put in reserve some ideas for webinars to cover, like in the winter months when people are staying indoors more or if there's you know, terrible things happen and we have to be indoors, but we won't talk about that. Let's yeah, not drink it. <laughs> um, but I can, I can put those in reserve and then we can also work on the in-person stuff, but that's, you know, whatever people want. Excellent. I think that brings us to the, the end of the, the Q&A. Um, Simon, once again, thank you so much. Uh, yet another really interesting and insightful webinar. And as always, you've really gone to town with, you know, answering the, the questions to to a, huge, to a big extent so yeah thank you yeah, thank you thank you to again. everyone who joined really appreciate it hopefully see you on another one soon have a good evening great have a good evening bye bye, bye, -bye.